you should not become a surgeon or any other doctor. I know a few people who became doctors and are absolutely miserable because it turns out the money isn't worth all the stuff you go through. The money isn't worth all the stuff you go through. That's the main quote. I can't explain to you why this guy decided to use Looney Tunes music to make this point, but this is probably one of a thousand YouTube shorts and other TikToks I've seen parroting this exact same one-dimensional perspective that medicine isn't worth it because of the high hours and low pay. And it's not that he's fundamentally wrong. I'm going to talk about physician salary in this video, but what you learn from looking at a 20 second TikTok or just Googling neurosurgeon salary will never have enough nuance to actually form a concrete justified opinion. There's so much I wish someone told me about undergrad as a pre-med and gap years and the non-studying related skills that you need to succeed in medicine. If this video literally helps one person avoid the mistakes that I did, then I think it's worth making. This is like the unfiltered big brother advice that I wish I got. I know this video is about the unfiltered truth of being a pre-med, but I think we need to start by talking about physician compensation because it's one of the most like disputed, contradictory pieces of information on the internet. It's like you could go online expecting to learn one thing and hear five different opinions that honestly just make you feel more confused than when you first started. The reality of it is that there is so, so much variance in what doctors make. And that's not just between different specialties. I think most people in medicine understand that like surgeons are going to earn more than pediatricians. But even within a single specialty, that intra-specialty salary difference is massive. Just as an example, let's look up up the average neurosurgeon salary, right? Neurosurgeon salary and see what shows up. Immediately we get our favorite <laughs> Gemini response. Um, it says the average salary is around 318K. The median is around 674K. Here we can scroll on to like these salary estimates, 590 to 380K. 110, I'm guessing that's like resident salary to 440K. 380 to 1.1 million if we go to Glassdoor. Pull this up here and boom, we're throwing two more numbers at us. There is a massive range in what the lowest end versus the highest end earners make in the field to the point where if you're basing it off of these numbers here from Glassdoor, it's like a 3X difference between bottom and top earners. We can do the same experiment for another field, right? Let's just look up neurologist salary right throw the surgery out the window I think it's generally understood that if you go into like a non-surgical field you might have a better lifestyle fields like neurology psychiatry these are known to be a little bit more relaxed again if we scroll down here we see the salary range right 640k to 400k Gemini is giving us its own set of numbers the idea here the important thing to understand is that there is a massive range within the particular field. Yes, it takes over a decade to become a doctor and it's a lot of hard work, but the point here that I'm trying to make is that you don't just have to go into surgery to make a lot of money. Even within a single specialty, the top earners 400K a year is more than a livable salary. You can go into a more relaxed field with a better lifestyle and still work towards earning a higher salary. And none of these numbers that we've been looking at for neurosurgery or neurologist, or if we were to look up another field, include what happens if you go into private practice or the percentage of doctors that go into real estate work. There are so many avenues in medicine to making money, to going into administration, to going into management, to working in a hospital or working as a professor that you can look into later in your career to help bring you that work life balance while also giving you the financial incentive that you want. I have to start the video by bringing this up because when I was like an early pre-med and I was applying to college, I felt that talking about like the amount of salary you were earning as a doctor was kind of a taboo subject. I was always scared to bring it up because it's generally like not a great idea to be at your interview and they ask you well, why do you want to go into medicine for the money right that, that's never the right answer but at the same time if you're putting in all of this effort going through this massive journey to get there if there's no reward at the end it's very hard practically in our human minds to just be motivated about it. Sure, you can be excited by the prospect of helping people. A lot doctors love helping people. But when you're working day in and day out, or you're doing those things in medicine that you don't enjoy, right? Not every single thing is going to have you jumping with joy. Some days you're going to wake up and not want to study, but still have to. You need a little bit more of a, a, a carrot on a stick in front of you to get you to just get out of bed and get going. And if you're consuming a lot of TikTok advice that's like scaring you out of this idea that you're not going to be properly compensated as a doctor, my goal with this intro bit is to relieve some of that pressure and hopefully bring back a little bit of motivation. If you put in the work now, you can absolutely buy that car you want, live in that house that you want, live the life that you want. That is the end goal. The real trade-off here that I, I wish someone told me before I started this pre-med journey is that to get to that final point, that ultimate end goal utopia of finally having made it and being in full control of your physician career is the reality of being a resident 
in the cost of medical school. If we're going to take the stance that not enough people are talking about the nuance of physician salary, it's probably 10 times more likely that you'll find someone who's willing to talk about the reality of resident salaries. A close friend of mine is working as an IM, internal medicine resident, at a top 10 program, and she earns about $65,000 per year while working up to 80 hour weeks. The way she describes it, and these are her words, not mine, is that you would literally earn more per hour working at McDonald's for minimum wage than your starting salary as a resident. If you're personally curious about these numbers, you can literally just look up like whatever specialty you want. So for example, like radiology, just look up radiology resident salaries. These are all fixed numbers. They have this term called like PGY, which stands for like postgraduate year one. So if you're in like a four year residency program, you have PGY one, two, three, and four. These are fixed publicly available numbers that you can go online and see. They are not large numbers. So when you spend four years of undergrad, likely taking gap years, and then do four years of medical school, your starting salary is barely enough to chip away at your student loans. Let's bring it back to the point. I'm not saying this to scare you away from medicine. I think the first point talking about the prospects of physician salary is hopefully meant to, to offset this part, but it's to stress how important having strong financial literacy and also understanding how you're actually going to make money in medicine. Having some kind of a plan for that is going into it. It's not just about studying. It's not just about cranking out pubs or getting volunteering hours or shadowing, you need to understand this side of medicine as well. And this side is not something that you're likely going to get credit for on your med school application, or it's not something that's going to help you get in, but it's something you need to have in order to succeed in the long run. No one is checking in on you for this. No one is going to ask you about it. There was a study that was actually done on Yale physicians who worked like for Yale, where they asked how many of them felt financially educated and prepared by their education. And the majority, the overwhelming majority of doctors said that they had no financial plan and they did not feel secure. Secure with their financial literacy, that is, not with their actual salary. If we take one step backwards, right, we talked about physicians, residents, now we're in medical school. I'm about to start medical school, right? I start medical school in July at Albany Medical College. Med school is not cheap. We know this, but the actual number is like, it's shocking. When you finally see it, when you open up your medical school portal, you're so excited to go to medical school and they tell you, oh, you completed the FAFSA, Prathik, congratulations. Here's the amount we're giving you as your grant. It's like a jaw dropping number. Brown University is like one of the more expensive medical schools. Let's just use that as an example and look up what their tuition costs, right? You can look up Brown University, Warren, Alpert, and you don't want to just look up tuition. You want to look up cost of attendance. And this includes things, not just tuition, but like your exam fees, uh, your rent, that sort of thing. We look it up and go straight to the Brown University website here. Here we can just scroll down, click on the MD program. And here you can see tuition, $73,000, right? And this is assuming that you're starting medical school with them next year. If you're in, still in your undergraduate years, if you're, for example, still in high school, you need to account for the fact that this tuition cost and overall cost of attendance is going to increase by about three to 4% every single year. So if you're two years out, you're three years out, you need to take this number and multiply it by 1.03 and like, you know, to the power of like two or three or whatever. And if we scroll down here, you get to the final budget. $108,000. Second year is $110,000 right now. You add up all four of these years and you also got to like keep in mind, right? Like th there might be other costs that you don't see. There might also be some other savings, right? We go, we go hand in hand, like tit for tat. You add all of this up, it's over $400,000. And then what about the money you just spent for four years of undergrad? That wasn't free. All of this to join like a surgery residency program where you have to get paid like peanuts for the next like five or six years. There's no practical way of paying back the student loans. And there's so much like detail here that I could go into about like, at least my personal opinion on why I feel like grant money shouldn't be as easily accessible because it just allows colleges to charge whatever they want. These little absorbent amounts because they know that like the federal aid FAFSA, is, they're just gonna match it, right? The government is gonna pay for it for now, but then you're the one who's stuck in the debt cycle for the next 10 years, or whoever knows how long paying back these student loans. If you don't have parental support, you're cooked. I just want to bring awareness to these things so that none of you guys are caught off guard. I remember when I started like my undergrad, I got like a pretty good scholarship and I just didn't expect that when I would start medical school that it would cost this much. Somehow I just believe that like the same way you get like scholarships for undergrad, you get like merit scholarships, this, that, you get more similar things in medical school. But a lot of times aside from like need-based aid, which is honestly like it's 
even for the people who do qualify for the need-based aid, it's never as much as you hope for or as much as you want. In the end, medical school is ridiculously expensive, and being like aware of that ahead of time and understanding that you need to orient yourself a little bit more from a business or finance angle or just do a little bit more, have a little bit more foresight about your career would just help you be prepared to account for these costs, budget for them, and figure out how you're going to pay them back later on. Okay, that is more than enough money talk for this video. Let's go ahead and talk about some of the other fun aspects of the journey. If you guys do want me to go in more nuance about this though, I am always more than happy to make another video just like diving into student loans, the problems with it, the things that we can do about it, that sort of thing. It's honestly pretty easy to just like parrot the quite known take at this point that medicine is a long journey. But what does that practically mean, right? It would be very easy for me to just sit here on camera and like restate the same take you've probably heard a hundred times, right? Medicine is a long journey and you need to pace yourself. But how do you actually balance living your life with medical school? What's the right way to do it? I've had periods of my college journey where I'm completely dialed in and focused, no distress distractions, working towards my goals every single day. And I've also had periods where I just go out, have fun, do whatever I want. What I've learned from that is one key lesson. It's a lot more practical and sustainable to integrate more smaller experiences and moments. Maybe you go out one night, maybe you go get dinner with a couple of friends, maybe you go see a particular movie, do something fun. Those sorts of things on a more frequent, regular schedule are much more realistic to do and able to balance with like a more structured, disciplined life than doing a bigger like weekend trip, for instance, after several days of just focused grinding. The thing about reaching your goals and whether that's like GPA or or aiming for a good MCAT score or just putting together your medical application is that you need the discipline, right? The consistency that comes with momentum and you can have momentum when you have these little breaks, right? Little things to like take your mind away from your work, get back to it. Oftentimes that gives you a fresh perspective. It's good for you. But when you have those like longer breaks or you decide to go on like a bender, right? Two or three days, you just do absolutely nothing. Getting back into the swing of things after that becomes 10 times more difficult. And then there's FOMO, right? You're in college, you're on friends, everyone's doing their own thing and you're wondering whether or not you're even going in the right direction, you got to understand that like your brain doesn't even fully develop until it's 25, right? It's still not even fully there. So listening to it and what it's telling you is not always the right thing to do. I don't think there's a single right answer to this. And my video is not meant to be like the end all be all here. But what worked for me personally was that when I'm with like college friends and I'm in university balance, you know, doing whatever you want to do, having fun with your studies. But then when the summertime comes around, have like a dedicated like monk mode period of your year. This is a period of time when you're entirely focused on a particular goal. So for example, I think for a lot of uh, pre-med students, it's going to be like studying for the MCAT, right? You have a dedicated period of time where there's no distractions, right? You completely delete social media. You can even like isolate yourself a little bit to just like your close friends and family and just work solely on that goal. Your brain can only focus on so many things at a time. I think summer break is perfect for this because you don't have school in the way and the amount of like productive gain that you get out of it. This period of focus is something that oftentimes, unless you're in the full swing of like a focused monk mode period, you're never going to achieve at any other point in the year. It's just a very pragmatic approach. When you have the most free time, you have the most flexibility and there's less like fun things going on, right? You're not with your college friends. Maybe your hometown friends are up to something and no one's saying you can't go hang out with them for like a couple days or go on a small trip. But when the opportunity presents itself for you to be able to achieve something meaningful, to do something, to get a couple of publications, or to reach that particular goal. You want to be as dialed in as possible for it, and that's how you get the maximum reward for your time. No hard work ever goes to waste, and by doing this now, it allows you to do what we talked about during the school year in having a little bit of balance, right? You can still have friends, you can still pace out this journey, you don't feel burnt out by the end of it. And then I also want to talk a little bit about like the emotions that come with having a gap year. For full disclosure, I'm starting medical school straight out of undergrad, right? I haven't had to take a gap year, but I have had a lot of friends that did need to. And I'm in like the full swing of like seeing people go off to start their jobs and I'm still the one going to college. I think I can speak on this. I had this theory that I pieced together when I was making this video and I call it the three eyes, okay? The three eyes of a gap year, but also like the pre-med journey in general. And they come down to these, isolation, insecurity, and impatience. There is inherently a level of like loneliness and isolation that comes with being so focused on a particular goal. You're on a very different path. And a lot of times, like for example, I went to like a tech school for undergrad, right? There's not that many pre-meds here. And so when people see you like grinding towards like research, for example, they don't even like fully understand like the relevance of it. When you're studying for your MCAT, if you have a bunch of friends who are in a different, like finance majors, right? They have a very different pace and trajectory of life. And so that can be a little bit isolating. And it's important to just acknowledge that because we can do 
do things to help prevent it. Insecurity is like a pretty self-explained one, right? There's FOMO about other people who are potentially doing better than you or doing different things than you, who have a higher GPA or an MCAT. Ignore it, right? Focus on your own journey. That's the only thing that matters here. It does not matter what MCAT score your roommate or the people in your group got. If you have a score that's competitive for medical school, that's what matters for you. And then there's the impatience, right? And that's not just about the fact that you have to like wait for medical school results, but it's also like the feelings, which ties into like insecurity as well, of whether or not it's going to work out this year. Some people need to take multiple, multiple gap years in order to get into medical school. As I'm starting, I'm beginning to meet like the rest of my medical school class and you meet people of all age ranges, right? Some people had an actual career. Some people took four or five gap years to get in. It is what it is. Ideally, we can streamline this process as much as possible through good strategy and hard work. But the amount of maturity and growth that I have seen in my own friends who have taken gap years and then gone into medical school, that like one gap year or two gap years, it completely changes them as people. They grow up so much, they get so much more mature, and when they come to medical school, those are the students who tend to do the best. It's like by the time you go through all of this, your brain actually does finish developing and you start medical school on like a completely different plane. I have one more thought that's also been on my mind a lot recently. And it's made me really grateful for pursuing a career in medicine. And so if you guys are pre-meds, I think it'll be good to hear. It's not some like sappy like BS, right? It's actually practical. I've probably said this like two or three times in the video and I guarantee you've heard this in real life, right? You tell people, oh, I'm studying to become a doctor. I want to become a doctor. And the response that they give you is, oh my God, I couldn't be a doctor. It it takes so long. It's just so much studying. I want to get fast money. I want to make fast money by going into like a different career. I want to go into business. I want to go into finance. I want to go into CS. Just take a second right now. How's the current job market doing? We're in 2025. Unemployment is skyrocketing. People who are graduating with CS degrees, which a couple years ago were landing them hundreds of thousands of dollars in starting packages. What's going on with them now? It wasn't always like this and things could completely change next year. But right now, where we are right now, people are applying in record numbers to master's programs, graduate programs, to law school, all to try to pursue higher education because they can't find jobs right now. The human experience is not as different as you'd think from one person to the next. If there's one single thing I've learned from YouTube in my business, it's that there's no such thing as easy money. It does not exist. No matter what career path you pick, you have to put in the grind to get to your goals. In medicine, that grind comes in the form of studying and schooling and having to work through residency to get there. In tech, it comes in the start of your career coming right out of college where you're working at a startup for 14 hours a day just hoping to get promoted. I have multiple friends of mine right now that are working internships where they have 14, 15 hours a day and they work six days a week, sometimes seven days a week just to try to impress their team and hopefully land a job after this internship because of how competitive things are right now. They get one opportunity and they devote their entire life to it. No social life, no extracurriculars, no activities, nothing except their work to try to get some kind of career security. In finance, it's the same thing. 100 hour a week analyst work weeks all to get burnt out by the age of 27. I'm not an advocate for these systems in any way, right? I think that you should have work-life balance, but I like to have a very practical outlook on life. Your life is really not that much harder than the next guy. It's just different. So don't drain your emotional bucket comparing yourself to people who are effectively in the exact same situation you're in. When you stay focused on your own version of the grind and at least appreciate the positives that you do have as a pre-med, right? The time you get to spend with your family on that gap year or the, the parts of your studying that you actually do like and appreciate and that are going to help you on later out in your career. When you look at it that way, it's a lot easier to tune out the background noise. This isn't my usual type of video, but I thought that it might help some of you guys, right? Other aspiring doctors out there hearing my thoughts as I enter medical school. If you want me to continue documenting my journey throughout medical school and hearing other lessons I learned from talking with physicians and surgeons and getting more into the weeds of medicine, more than happy to make videos on that in the future. Just let me know in the comments. This has been your work with Thank you all so much for watching. Best of luck with medical school. Peace.